Hello and welcome to today's session on adaptive housing. Uh, we're here at the Resource Centre of Murphy Batista and uh, we'd like to spend some time today talking to you about exactly what adaptive housing is and uh, so we'll go through that. Um, today's presentation overview is going to include a brief introduction on myself, uh, what is uh, adaptive housing and how we define that getting to know your team, uh, gathering your financial information, and then developing a plan. My name is Owen Barclay. I'm a certified aging in place specialist. I started my company called Accessible Home and Property Services seven years ago to try and help people live longer, safer, and more comfortably in their homes. Uh, one of the reasons why I got into the business was because of my son Ryan, who at a very early age, about 20 years ago, was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it was going through all those exercises of trying to hire contractors to modify our own home that we learned how difficult the process was. So at some point I decided seven years ago that I wanted to be that contractor to help and guide people through the renovation process that they needed to do in their own homes. Uh, I'd like to thank Murphy Batista for hosting us today and uh, also uh, I'd like to thank the attendees for being here today and, um, and coming to join in this information session. Um, what is a Certified Aging in Place Specialist? Uh, I got accredited through the National Association of Home Builders. They created a program to accredit professional building professionals, architects, nurses, uh, building designers, so that we would come up with a common set of uh, goals and, and deliverables to people uh, consistently uh, in, in, in the building trades. So. What really is uh, universal or, or adaptive housing? Uh, we follow the principles of something called universal des design. And I'd like to just read to you exactly what that is. It describes the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. And this was developed by this, 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 this uh, expression was from Ronald Mason, architect. And basically what he was saying was that the way that we've traditionally built things is that they have barriers in them to people. And so what we needed to do was move to a design concept where everything is open and accessible to everyone. And I'll just give you one little example of that. We built a ramp for an older gentleman who uh, had hip problems, he needed a walker, he couldn't navigate the stairs in his home. He was fussing about getting this ramp put in, but his, his daughter made him do it. Well, he called us, or his daughter called us about two years later and told us that he was loving the ramp, but mostly because his dog was getting older and, and the dog could no longer climb the stairs, so the dog was using the ramp. So he used the ramp because he had to, but he was so happy that his dog was able to use it because he could. So sometimes when we go to our clients and we talk to them about universal design concepts, it's not necessarily a just about them. It could be about putting in a ramp so their friends can come to visit. It could be about putting in a ramp so that um, their, their daughter or their granddaughter can roll the stroller up the walkway. So historically, again, we've, we've built things with stairs which are prohibitive in nature. And the idea is to open these spaces up and make them accessible to people all the time for everyone. Um, the, design of, or the concept of universal design really is a newer design following something called barrier-free design. And that was coined by uh, Selwyn Goldsmith in 1963 when she developed the curb cut that we see commonly today on streets. But the whole notion of barrier-free design assumes that we're going to start with a barrier and then we're going to eliminate the barrier as opposed to universal design which really starts with the concept from the very beginning being the correct one. And all of this has led to something in the States and, and we follow it now in Canada called the ADA which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so that's the guide that I use in going into people's homes and developing spaces which are accessible to everyone including their friends and family. So, uh, another term that we hear a lot of times out in the field is something called ADLs. Anybody know about ADLs? Yes? Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. Well, basically, it stands for dressing, eating, ambulating, toileting, and hygiene. So these are all the things that you have to be able to do in order to get through your daily functions in life. And a lot of times, um, you, and, and you may have already experienced some of these, but when you're 
assessed or someone with a disability is assessed for what they can and can't do, it's typically on their ADLs. And we hear things like, well, he can do two out of five. He can do these two or he can do those three. And, and based on this can determine whether someone's capable of living at home independently or whether they, they need assistance in certain areas. The thing for me as, a, as a, a, an adaptive housing specialist is that 50% of these activities happen in the bathroom. So it's no wonder, given that bathrooms are the smallest, most confined place in your home, and that 50% of these things happen in the bathroom, it's no wonder that we do bathrooms every day of the week, all day long. And originally when I started my business, I thought that we would be doing more ramps and widening doorways, but it's bathroom renovations. It's taking out bathtubs and putting in showers. It's putting in knee spaces. It's creating more storage. It's lever faucets, all these various different things because we want people to be able to use the things that we create. It's universal design, but it's also enabling independence. So we want to give people the tools and the resources to be able to do things themselves like they've always wanted to do or have been used to be doing in the past. Uh, there are so many things within a home or an environment that we can address for you as aging in place specialists. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the specific things that we do. Uh, every client is unique, every situation is unique. And we have assessment forms where we can go into a home and we can go through a whole list of things. Um, many of them are common. We install grab bars frequently for clients. I've probably installed over a thousand grab bars myself over the years I've been doing this. But you know, there are common things amongst grab bars over bathtubs, on back walls, but what we do is we cater to the specific needs of each person as we go this. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go in and say, well, the code says that this should be here or this should be there. But if she's an older Asian lady, then maybe we have the, the, the bar lower. Or maybe if someone is, is going to feel a little bit uh, more nervous in the tub, we move the, 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 the bar in. So those type of things, because it's within a person's individual home, we can actually adapt them for their needs as opposed to the general population. Of course, when we're asked to install things like grab bars in commercial spaces, those do have to be installed according to the code because those apply to people in general, not a specific person. So therefore the code needs to be followed a little bit more carefully. But some of the things that we can address in a bathroom situation are the toilet height and style. These days we use the term comfort height toilet. That means it's a higher toilet. For most older people, they want an elongated bowl as a round bowl. It's a little bit easier to use. Grab bars, we install hundreds of these uh, a year, if not thousands. We do a lot of walk-in versus wheel-in showers. And this is a, an important distinction, is that many contractors out there don't understand really what is the difference between a walk-in shower and a wheel-in shower, or a roll-in shower, as we otherwise call it. What we try and do is we work with the occupational therapist and the client to determine the long-term needs of the person. Because there's only you only want to have to do this once. So if you're going to do it once, do it right. So there's a lot of discussion that goes in about that. Uh, gliding handheld showers. Uh, if someone's going to be sitting, having a shower head up high doesn't work anymore. So having something on a gliding bar where you can move it up and down makes a lot of sense. Anti-scald diverters, knee space vanities. We want to give people the opportunity to be able to roll up under the vanity, wash their hands, brush their teeth, groom themselves independently, or even have a caregiver there doing it for them, but they can do it at the sink where it's supposed to be done. Lever style faucets, non-slip floors, heat lamps or heated floors. A lot of people with disabilities, uh, older people struggle from keeping warm. So if we can adapt the type of heating style that's in the home, that can make it a lot more comfortable for them. Door width, accessible plugs. You know, there's always that plug up high on the wall. A lot of times if we redo a vanity, we'll bring that plug in, we'll put it right in the very front so someone can plug in their, their device really close and do that. So the bathroom, there's a lot of different types of things that we can do. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll just look at doing a, a, a simple uh, tub conversion into a shower, but many times it's also full, full on bathroom renovation. 
entry and exit of your home, this relates to something that we call visitability. And that's the ability uh, to give uh, people, we talked earlier about loved ones coming to visit. There are stories about how uh, a lady would hold, would become a part of a bridge club and, and she would want to continue to have uh, the ladies come for bridge every week, but unfortunately one of the ladies uses a walker or can't na navigate the stairs, so she stops coming. It's really important to create an environment in your own home to make it visitable for other people to come. When my son was in a wheelchair, my parents were always very grateful that they had a level entry home. So even though my son couldn't get upstairs, he could still come into the house and celebrate and, and, and spend the time with the family without a lot of barriers there in place. Um, so we talked earlier about ramps. There are also walkways versus stairs. Porch lifts, which is basically like an outside elevator that goes up and down. Uh, we do a lot of railings. Uh, we, we find that there'll be two or three steps down from a, from a porch onto a level entry, and seniors have a real tough time negotiating that. So we're doing railings for them all the time. Lighting. Um, I don't remember the statistic now, but as you age, your, your ability to see in the dark dramatically increases, so having improved lighting in, in areas makes a big difference. Non-slip surfaces in our, in our inclement weather here in the rain, uh, being able to have non-slip surfaces and, and avoiding falling uh, makes a big difference. Door widths and thresholds are other things. Uh, other areas in the home to look at, the hallways, again, lighting, uh, turning radiuses if you're using a walker or a wheelchair, non-slip surfaces and elimination of area rugs. We have always have a real trouble with seniors trying to get them to avoid using area rugs. My, uh, my parents just put a brand new area rug in their kitchen and my mother is tripping over it constantly, but she claims that it's good for her back. She can't stand at the sink without having this area rug under. There's just some battles that you can't win, and so I just hope she doesn't fall. <laughs> um, stair climbers are another thing there. In the kitchen, um, looking at varied or adjustable countertop heights, accessible oven and microwave, knee space under sink and lever style faucet, rollout shelves. Rollout shelves are something that are becoming more and more popular these days because, especially for seniors, getting down on their hands and knees and trying to access the back of cupboards is very difficult. And in many situations, we can actually come in and get our cabinet people to, to build extension uh, drawers for, for cupboards. We're just doing a lady, we're doing 10 drawers in her kitchen for her. And that's going to give her the ability to just walk over to that cupboard, open the door, open, roll out the drawer, and access all those things that she previously didn't have access to. So I see some heads nodding that well, that's an important thing. It's just so much easier to just... Uh, sure, yeah. sure. Understand that, yeah. Um, Environmental controls. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to do a lot of that, but as technology increases, battery-operated devices, it's uh, we're seeing products like the Nest now, which is heating controls, still very, very expensive, really, really high price point, close to three hundred dollars for a thermostat for your home. Um, sure, it, it it learns a lot of things and it understands your behavior and, and what you're doing. And the fact that you can program it from your smartphone across the world is a great thing. But that's still, you know, out of a lot of people's price points. So that's another thing that we have to take into consideration is, you know, what are people's budgets for doing these things and, and how can we get the most things done for them that they need done with the budget that they have to work with. So let's move on to your team. Um, certainly we don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, we consider that uh, when, when someone is doing a home renovation, uh, there's significant dollars involved. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we get really one chance to do this right. So we wanna make sure that uh, all the team members that are involved get a say in what's important and what gets done. Um, particularly in our case, the occupational therapist. Um, much of our business is referred to us directly from occupational therapists who are specialists in their field and they understand what a person's current uh, functional limitations are, not just now but also in the future and that's something that we can't predict. So we work very closely with occupational therapists. They understand the, uh, the, the, the medical side of it, we understand the construction side of it and together we can really put a good plan together. 
So often the clients don't know what they need. This isn't something that people are doing necessarily because they want to. It's because they have to because of a situation that's occurred. So they don't know where to start, so it's up to us to lead them along the way. But the other people that could be involved is, is your attorney and, and what role might they play in, in the role adaption? Are there going to be funds coming from some person as a result of a, of a payout on, on an accident or, or not? But certainly um, we've on occasion had uh, lawyers involved in terms of helping us write contracts with our clients too because that helps to protect everybody involved. Uh, the contractor, um, that could be anybody, but hopefully it's going to be me. Um, financing, this is a big issue and we'll talk about that next. But uh, it's, it's how, how are you going to fund this renovation and have you ever done one before and do you know how a renovation works? Is it going to be on a cost plus basis? Is it going to be fixed price? Um, will your funder pay more if it goes over budget? All these various different things. But having your financer, your funder in the program and, and as part of the team is very important. And also family and friends. Um, very, very often we get involved with sons and daughters of parents because they're trying to help them navigate this slippery slope that they're on. Uh, it could be parents of children that need the home adaptations, but we certainly welcome input from everybody. And uh, so we consider that all these people are part of your team and we're, we're certainly willing and able to work with each one of them to make sure that the outcome of your renovation project is successful. In terms of financial resources, uh, you probably already know most of these things. Uh, there's, there's, the good, there's the good old private pay. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, there are certainly lots of seniors that we're working with uh, in the community that have managed to downsize. They've freed up some capital and now that they can afford to adapt it. I've had seniors tell us in the past that, well, we used to travel around the world, we can't do that anymore, so now we're just going to do the things that we have to to stay safe and, and live in our home as long as possible. And, and talking about staying and living in your home as long as possible, um, statistics say that, that as seniors age, that's where they want to stay. They want to stay in their traditional home. I don't consider that I have a huge role in that decision. Certainly we're there to provide information and be a resource to them as, as part of that decision, but we don't decide whether they're gonna stay there or they're gonna sell the home. So we just figure that we're just another member of that team. ICBC, um, this is uh, according to people I've talked to recently, uh, personal injury claims as a result of vehicle accidents has dropped dramatically and that's largely due to the safety of the vehicles that are on the road today. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but apparently it doesn't happen as, as frequently as, as it does. But in that case, um, typically uh, if you're in an accident, a serious accident and, and have ex extensive injuries, there's a cap on the amount that can be paid out and I believe it's $150,000. Well, by the time that you pay for a, a power wheelchair and a wheelchair accessible van, uh, a hospital bed, a commode, um, orthotics, all the other things that you may need to, to help you move back home. There's not, that's really not a heck of a lot of money. And uh, so that money needs to be spent very carefully. And there's obviously certain things that have to, have to be done. But I got to admit that usually the home renovation, the home adaptation is where they're coming to us with simply pennies left in the budget and saying, what can you do with this? So, but at the other side of the spectrum, we're also cognizant of that and we want to make sure that whatever renovations we do helps prefer, preserve that capital fund for as long as possible. Work safe, unfortunately the, in, in today's world there are still workplace injuries and uh, uh, work safe, particularly work safe BC does a great job of supporting their injured workers in the community and uh, we get invited to participate in bids to do renovations and, and various different home adaptions for them. So if you've been injured in a workplace accident this would be a, a potential source of funding for your modifications. Extended health plans, those are as different as colors in the sky, so um, you need to be very, very careful about how you approach your extended health plan. There could be uh, lifetime maximums involved, there could be per item maximums, it could be family limits. Um, there, there are so many variables. Uh, my recommendation to you on, 
on working through your extended plan is, is become very familiar with it and don't do anything until you have it in writing from the, uh, the plan administrator because um, you can spend money and uh, very quickly and, uh, and, and get into your maximums and, and run out of money very quickly as well. So that's, a, that's another place. Uh, veterans Affairs, uh, we do a lot of work for our, our veterans. Many of our World War II veterans pretty much have, uh, have left their traditional home. There are still a few of them around. We build ramps for them. We, uh, we do a lot of bathtub to shower conversions for them, handrails uh, front and back. And uh, Veterans Affairs has been, uh, uh, you know, for the most part, Veterans are, are very happy with the services that they've received from Veterans Affairs, and we find them to be a great organization. So that's another place where we get uh, funding from. Um, I'll, I'll leave this one till, till last. Uh, so often, um, families run into real difficulties when they have a child with a disability and uh, they're needing modifications done to their home. Very, very few organizations step up. There are organizations that will pay or help pay for an accessible van or a wheelchair. Uh, they can go to the ministry uh, for families and children and get funding for ceiling track lifts and such things. But, but when it comes to actually modifying the home, tearing out a bathtub, putting in a roll-in shower, uh, putting in an elevator versus, versus stairs, um, there are really, really very few funders. So what ends up happening if the family has the capability and the skills to do it is, is soliciting funds from the various different service clubs that are out there, whether they be Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions Clubs. Um, they, these organizations all raise money throughout the year with the express uh, mandate that they have to give that money away. There are limits as to how much that they can give on, on certain uh, situations. Um, I personally will tell you that I found it very difficult to try and go fundraise uh, for our family when we needed to get things done. It was a really hard thing to do. It felt like begging. I, I didn't like it. Um, and so my advice to people now is to try and engage a family member or a friend of the family to be your advocate in these areas. Um, so often there are people that you might not see in your life, but you know in your life who want to help, but don't know how they can help. So this is an area that you could you could encourage them to go out and advocate for you. And so what they would do is that they would they would write letters on your behalf. They would make phone calls on your behalf to try and go to these various different organizations and solicit funds. Um, it can be very successful. Um, we haven't talked what a bathroom renovation costs these days, but it's. It's certainly in the $20,000 range, so if you wanted to get it paid for by service clubs, you'd have to go out to 20 different service clubs and be successful at getting $1,000 from each one of them, and that's no small amount, right? So the other thing that we find, and I think this is a fact, um, is that people that have disabilities have more issues getting steady employment and and having a successful career so the access to funds you know it, there are some uh, diseases disabilities out there where people have managed to have a, a, a long stable career and and through their extended health plan they're they're now able to have a well they, they're able to get extended health benefits but they may also qualify for some sort of a disability pension as well but uh, for the most part, money is very, very hard to come by. And this is one of the things that we try and do, is we try and spend a lot of time finding ways of doing things more economically for our clients. Unfortunately, materials are expensive, labor is expensive, insurance is expensive. Uh, all of these things are expensive for us as a contractor, but at the end of the day, we're trying to do this the most economically we can for people. BC Housing. Uh, <clears throat> It's actually um, a program called HAFI, and that stands for Home Adaptions for Independence. And what happened was it about, well, I think it started in about 1977 or something like that as a temporary program by uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the CMHC, and they came up with something called the RAP grants. And those were disability grants that people with disabilities could apply for up to $16,000 to renovate their home and, and continue living in it. 
Well, about five to six years ago, the BC government went to CMHC and said, we don't want you giving money to the residents of British Columbia. They, we have our own programs and sometimes people are double dipping into programs, some people are getting nothing. So what we want you to do is we want you to fund our province and what we'll do is we'll come up with a comprehensive program that duplicates what you're, you're offering through the RAP program and, uh, and, and you can fund us and then we'll administer the program. So that's exactly what they did. So it was done through BC Housing and this special department is, is called HAFI. And so the HAFI program is basically um, a program where someone who meets the qualifications can get up to $20,000 to modify their home to make it more accessible. So if you're a senior living in a mobile home park and you need to have a, a bathtub taken out and a shower put in or you, your, your, your spouse can't navigate the stairs anymore and you need to have a porch lift installed, you can make an application to HAFI. There's three criteria that you have to meet in order to qualify for the housing grant. First is your home value has to be below a certain limit. And right now in Surrey, the home value has to be less than $625,000. Well, I can tell you there aren't too many homes that are worth less than $625,000. So you're largely limited to townhouses, condos, and mobile home parks. The limit in Vancouver, I think, is about $925,000. I think one of the big problems with that right now is that we have seniors that are living in million dollar homes, two million dollar homes, but they have no cash flow. They, they're, they're what my dad used to call uh, house poor, and that is they've got this great home, but they have no ability to do the renovations and stay there. What BC Housing is going to do about that in the future, I'm not sure. I guess they're looking and saying, well, you need to go and get a, uh, a chip mortgage, like a reverse mortgage, or, or uh, property tax deferrals is another way that seniors can get money, which we haven't talked about up here. But uh, So that's, that's number one thing, is that your home value has to be a certain amount. Also, your income, the combined family income has to be below a certain amount. So you could be two seniors living on CPP and, and OAP, and qualify for the housing grant based on that. But if your son or your grandson lives with you and he works full time at McDonald's even, or, or, or even, a, even a minimum wage paying job, that's probably gonna push the household income over the level. So, so again, you have to be very careful what your household income is. We've had situations in the past where people have actually asked their grandchildren or these people that are living in their home to change their permanent address and move so they can qualify to get the, these grants. $20,000 is a lot of money to get, right? So the third area you must qualify on is your assets. So if you have a home in uh, Birch Bay, a summer home in Birch Bay, if you have a motor home, uh, any asset other than your personal vehicles in your home that's that total to more than hundred thousand dollars you won't qualify for the happy grant well when we talk about that usually the seniors roll their eyes and they say well no, we don't have any money we don't have anything like that so it's usually either the home value limit or the income limit we had a woman uh, just this year who came to us she'd come to us two years ago and tried to do a grant, but she couldn't get her, her affairs in order to, 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 to go through the process. But in the meantime, her home value jumped from $450,000 to $650,000. And this year she was $25,000 over the limit and she didn't qualify for, for the grant. And she, she kept on asking me, like, well, what can you do? Like, what can I do? Surely they'll give me the grant. And, I, and it's beyond my control. It's, it's, it's very stringent regulations that BC Housing have in place for specific reasons, and, and, and they, they don't bend the rules on them. So, so you've got to qualify on those three um, areas. If you do, what you do is you contact BC Housing and uh, you tell them your situation. They'll send you out a, a, an application package. You, uh, depending on the value of the renovation that you're planning on doing, um, if it's under $5,000, all you need is one estimate. If it's under $10,000, you need two estimates. And if it's over $10,000, you need three estimates. So you gather your estimates and they should be similar in scope of work and materials used. 
and you submit that along with all your banking information, your, your tax statements, uh, your property tax, all these different types of things into, into BC Housing. And if you need assistance with those, we can help you with those documents. And then uh, your application will be reviewed. Typically takes four to six weeks if BC Housing has money at the time. They have a budget year and sometimes they run out of money. And, uh, and, and then you'll wait four to six weeks. And, and if your application is approved, they'll call you and they'll ask you which contractor uh, you want to work with. And as long as all the, the contractor that you want to work with price is relatively in line with the other quotes, they'll allow the, the client to choose the contractor. The reason that they do that is that they are a funding agency only. And as a funding agency, the client has to hire and, and, and have a relationship directly with the contractor. So when somebody hires us, it's a contract between us and the client. We get them to sign the contract and, and we go through the whole thing. And at the end of when the job is done, we present them with an invoice that they then turn into BC Housing. That gets paid in two or three weeks back to the client and then the client pays us. So we have to carry that debt for that period of time. But if we know that they've been, if they've qualified for the HAFI grant, and we know that we're going to do a good job, then we don't have any concern about, about getting paid. So that's how the process works. If, uh, if you go over the $20,000 in your quote, then you have to show ways and means by how you're going to pay for that before they'll actually approve your grant because they're worried about the relationship between uh, the client and, and the individual contractor. It's a great program. It's been going on for about four years. We probably, well, I shouldn't say how many we do a year, but we do a lot of renovations every year for Haffey, and it's, and it's enabled a lot of people to live longer, safer, and more comfortably in their homes. Um, that's a lot on financial resources. Um, so as we sort of start to wrap up here, um, one of the things that we see is, is, is when people aren't organized, their, their renovation doesn't go along very well or, the, or what they need to do. And so there's, there's kind of a lot of, a few things that you really need to, to pay attention to in order to make this a, a successful process. First of all, you need to understand your realities, where you're living, what's possible, what, what you have to work with, what tools, what resources, uh, what your needs are, but understanding your realities is very important. Plan for the foreseeable future. That's something that we really try and work on. We had a client who, um, he was about a 92-year-old veteran, still living in his home with a, with a significantly younger wife. And, and I asked the question, I said, how long are you going to continue to live here? And he said, well, they're going to carry me out of here in a box. And, and everybody always says that, but do they really mean it? And I said, okay, sir, well, do you really mean that? If, if, if your hip continues to get worse and worse and worse to the point where you can't walk and you have to go around in a wheelchair every day, where are you going to live? And he said, here. And his wife nodded. So I said, so the other proposal that you've received is a, is a step-in shower, not a roll-in shower. So at some point in the future, if you, went, if you go with that type of design, you'll be in a wheelchair, but you'll still be unable to shower. So if you truly want to live here until the very last opportunity you can, and you need to be rolled in and out of the shower, then you need a roll-in shower. And so they understood that. and. Uh, um, we did the job and, and it worked out It worked out really well. But understanding that, and I mentioned earlier about the occupational therapist, they understand the trajectories of people's uh, functional uh, issues. And so a lot of times, you know, we'll say, well, what's required in the future? Can we do a step-in shower? Do we need to do a ramp? Or, you know, is, uh, is, is, are his uh, shoulders going to become too sore in the future to be able to, to roll himself up and down? a ramp so should we be considering a platform lift. So these are the types of things, planning for the foreseeable future. Include your goals and dreams. Um, a lot of times what we do with our clients is we sit down and say, okay, if we had a blank canvas here, if the bathroom was empty, how would we design it to start with? As opposed to saying, well, can we adapt this space? And sometimes it might mean moving a toilet in order to get a roll-in shower, but but in the big picture, if that's ultimately the way the design needs to be, that's the way to look at it. Take your time if you can, start early. I, I know so many people that, that have wanted to build a house 
and you know as soon as they sign the contract with the builder the builder says okay I need to know the color of the roof uh, and I need to know what kind of siding you want on the house and all these things and I need those next week and they go well we haven't even broken ground yet but but these decisions need to be made early. As far as HAFI goes, and I didn't mention this, is that once you've been granted uh, the, uh, the funds from HAFI, you only have 90 days in order to complete the work. That's only three months. Uh, I'm currently booked out over three months. So if, if, I, if, if you want to have a contract with me, we've got to plan this early up front in order to make sure that we, we can get it done for you. Embrace universal design. Uh, partner with the right contractor. I'm not necessarily going to be the right person in every situation. We like to think that we can do the best job we can for everybody, but uh, maybe we're not in the right locale. Maybe uh, you have a preference for a different contractor. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, that's fine. But just make sure that you partner with the right contractor. Uh, we just did a job for someone um, in mission and we had given them a quote for $16,000 to modify their bathroom and they felt that our quote was too high so they hired another contractor for $12,000. They thought that the travel distance as well as potentially our hourly rate was the difference. What it turned out to be the big difference was how the shower was built and as he started to build this shower, believe it or not, the threshold at the door was going to be two and a half inches by the time it got out there. This guy is a is a full quad. He can't negotiate a two and a half inch lip at his bathroom door. So what happened? The contractor realized that he was on thin ice, that he wasn't able to provide a solution that was going to work for these people. So he stopped showing up. Okay, so he did about $5,000 worth of work and walked away with about $8,000 of their money. So they came back to us and they hired us and we finished the work for $11,000. And it's beautiful, it's amazing, they love it. But they're now into it for $19,000 and they could have been into it for 16. And the point I wanna make here is that I'm a contractor, I'm a human, I can make mistakes, I can judge things incorrectly. If you don't understand what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm quoting you, if you're not sure of the differences between the quotes, take them back to the person that you trust and ask them. Ju ask me to justify why my price is $4,000 higher. Maybe I won't be able to justify it, maybe I will, but you're entitled to that explanation and, and I encourage you to, to make sure that you've asked all the questions that you possibly can of your contractor and of your team to make sure that this project is success, as successful as possible. You only get a chance to do it once. Determine your budget, staying within your budget, particularly as far as HAFI goes, is very, very important. Get a contract in writing, always. We do every job in contract. We do a, an elaborate scope of work, we do an estimate, uh, and that is a can be a contracted fixed price estimate particularly with Hafi because you can't you can't go over right there there can't be overages and um, we give a schedule of allowances so if there's tiles we calculate how many square feet of tile the cost per tile so that's the budget you have to spend how much does a faucet cost so you know if we budget a hundred dollars for a faucet and you decide that you want a faucet that's hundred and fifty dollars well that's fine you just have to pay us an extra fifty dollars but we, we provide all this documentation and then we determine a timeline and from that, that's the schedule as to how the job proceeds. Everybody knows what's going on. There are no, there are no hidden gems. And that's it. That pretty well covers it. You take advantage of all of these ideas, your renovation is going to be a slam dunk. <laughs> All right, so uh, once again, we'll hang around the Resource Center here for a little bit, and if you have questions, come on over, let's chat about things and see if we can't get you on a roll. Okay, have a good night.